this industry has really repositioned India and Indians yes. in the minds of a global audience, and particularly the U.S. Uh, a few years ago, when Dilbert wrote their comic strip, and I'm particularly using this because you left that poor character out, they introduced Asok, the IIT engineer, right? And the guy was there for a number of months, worked extremely hard, but somewhere, if you recall, all the employees got together and killed him, right? Because he worked too hard. Do you see that happening anymore, or is that over and done with? Well, I work very hard. None of my colleagues have tried to kill me, as far as I can tell. No, look, the people get offended. I know there's some people, friends of mine, who get very offended when they hear. Every comedian in America today, part of their routine is making jokes about outsourcing. And they make jokes about uh, uh, call centers and calling, uh, having to talk with somebody who claims that their name is Charlie, but speaks in an accent that they cannot understand. And people do get offended, but m my view is more philosophical. I think that's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing because comedy is a very effective way of communicating. And what it is communicating is that we're smart people. So you can laugh at us. That's all right. We should learn to laugh at ourselves a little more. But if, if that means that while laughing at us, it raises, your, it raises us in your esteem, that's a good thing. That's my view. That's great to hear. But you've written on issues that are both are, are very controversial. And I think one of the qualities that people have always seen in you is uh, that you've always written and spoken about what you think is right, right? Irrespective of what the audience thinks. And a good example is when you put Amir Khan on the cover of Satime Jayate, you know, obviously, out here, there were a lot of people who felt that was deserved. But there were also a lot of people who probably felt that there were other issues or better issues that could probably be covered. It obviously takes a lot of courage and conviction to do that. So help us understand what keeps the fire in your belly burning. Um, well, it's, it's not hard. Of all the jobs that I could have imagined, when I was a young man, journalism is the only thing that, that ever really captured my imagination. I've only ever wanted to be a journalist. There's nothing else I've ever wanted to be. Um, and in, important people early in my life influenced me. Um, I, I went to school in Cochin for a couple of years. And, uh, and there was a gentleman who, uh, by the name of Manju Menon, his wife is here with us today who crystallized for me what I should be doing with my life. And he said to me, what are the things you're interested in? And I said, well, I'm interested in people. I'm interested in, in finding out what I don't know, not necessarily in an academic way, but in general. I have a curiosity, and I like to write. And he said, well, then you should be a journalist. And until that moment, I had not really thought of it. But then that's all I ever thought of after that. And it's the great thing about being a journalist is that Literally, this is literally true. No two days are alike. One day I'm interviewing Amir Khan, which is wonderful. Or I'm interviewing Sachin Tendulkar, that's also wonderful. Or I find myself in a war zone and I'm interviewing somebody who's about to become a suicide bomber. And, and the difference in, in these two things couldn't be greater. But as a, as a, as a curious human being, each in its own way is, is riveting. And so... My profession has been many things. It has been tiring, it has been trying, it has been frustrating, it has never been boring. And I don't think it ever will be. Fantastic. And as a, you know, in your career as a, a magazine editor, you've seen these great transformations between the print media and the digital media as well. There are clearly lessons for all of us because we keep all the time interacting with dramatic changes in technology, quite often created by us. Yes. So what are the lessons there that you think you can share you know, with I us? Would, I, frankly, I would learn, like to learn lessons from you. You guys are used to, to being in a business where disruption is a natural part of the natural order, and that every three or four years you, you make a dramatic shift in, in the way you approach your business. That, that, the, my profession has a problem with that particularly on the, on the business side of, of journalism, there's the old print media 
titans have had a great deal of difficulty adjusting to the new realities, and, and which is why when I decided that I was going to move to a digital platform, my choice was between doing it within Time Magazine, so to go and work for Time.com, or to go outside to Quartz, which, is, which was new, unheard of, but completely digitally native. And the reason I chose Quartz is because of that, because it had no, it was not burdened by the legacies of print. Uh, it was not, it, it didn't carry all the bad habits of print. It, it created a whole new way of thinking about news, and that excited me. And the, the, it's not as dramatic a shift, perhaps, as, as you experience in your industry, but for, for an industry that has not changed a great deal for decades upon decades, like, like journalism, the last 15 years have been a shock to the system. And as you look around, you see that the old institutions are having a great deal of difficulty adjusting to that shock. They're, they're thrashing around, trying to copy a little bit from this digital platform, a little bit from that one. Uh, Quartz is designed, for instance, it's an award-winning web design, and everybody seems to be copying it now. Um, but that's not, that's not enough. Copying uh, uh, one aspect of a digital platform is not going to change the fortunes of the New York Times or Time Magazine or the Times of India, for that matter. I don't think that it is given that these institutions will all fail. I think some of them will survive. The ones that are survive, that will survive are the ones that are smartest about their digital strategy. Um, but I decided I wanted, I didn't want to dip my toe in the water. I wanted to dive into the deep end. Um, and, and the fact that you guys do this all the time is really quite astonishing. That's interesting. In fact, there's a lot of parallels there. You know, in the years of the past, all of us running companies would guard our strategic plans like as if it was God's gospel, right? But these days we're very clear. We share it with competition because we yeah. know very well each of us are the only people who can implement that strategy, right? Yeah. And the document by itself you know, has no meaning. So clearly you're very comfortable with this big change. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to me. In the, digital world, in the digital news world, we share the same thing. We, first of all, we crowdsource our ideas and we allow our readers to tell us how best to serve them, not in terms of making choices of stories, but the platform, the, the look and feel. Um, and we, we're constantly talking to our competition, constantly. We, we exchange, you know, I've had, even in the short time that I've been at Quartz, I've had people from other uh, platforms calling me saying, hey, listen, we want to hire somebody for this particular job. You recently hired someone in that kind of position. Were there people who you felt were close to what you wanted, but you couldn't hire them, can you pass on their CV to us? Now, in the old print media, that would be unthinkable. They would not think to ask us such a question, and we would not deign to answer such a question. But in the web world, sure, here are the five names. Good luck to you. That's the way we function. What about managing talent in your, in your you know, role as editor of Time? You, you obviously had to manage a global kind of yeah. you know, team. And all of us running these companies also have to do that. We have teams, you know, who operate from across the globe. We have, you know, expanded the business in such a way that now it's gone well beyond the shores of India, right? Yeah. And uh, so any lessons for us and, uh, you know, give us a sense of how you manage those teams. Well, I think, I think this, uh, the challenges are the same. In, 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 in the digital news world, by definition, our staff tends to be very young. For the first time in my life, I'm the oldest person in a newsroom. And it's not just that they're young in age. Their attitude towards their jobs are very different. They are not interested in money and in position and in rank and in title in the way that we were when we were that age. They want to be challenged. They want to be doing interesting things. And so the, the challenge for me when I was at Time was to deal with some of these older notions. Well, you, you promoted that person, they and I joined at the same time, how come you promoted them and not me? You know, how come that person is getting a raise and I'm not getting a raise? These, these kinds of questions. And I'm not, I'm not saying these are not valid questions, but those que questions represent an, a form of thinking that is dying out. At Quartz, the young people who work for us, they're constantly telling us, what can we do that's news? That's new. What... Uh, uh, 
you know, money, I have not yet, okay, I've only been there a little while, but I've not yet had a situation where someone's come and asked me for a raise or, or asked me to bring them up to the same level as somebody else. They're always asking for what can we do that's cool and new. And I think that must be the similar, it must be similar to you. How can we learn? Right. The notion that, you, that, that a career is not simply about making money, but about learning constantly, that's the big change. Great. And you, you obviously worked across different countries, different cultures, and you probably have experienced some, you know, had some very pleasant experiences, the, the gun and the, uh, you know, the, the tank, and some unpleasant ones as well. So why don't you share, you know, a few of those examples of some pleasant ones and unpleasant ones also, and, and how you coped with them. Well, the unpleasant situations, if you're a conflict journalist, the unpleasant situations uh, have to do with violence. And for me, the most unpleasant situations had, uh, were ones in which friends and colleagues were, were hurt or killed. Um, when I ran, uh, I ran Times Baghdad Bureau for five years. In that time, I had a colleague who was killed because he worked for Time. I had one who lost his hand in, a, in an explosion. Um, I had two Iraqi colleagues who were kidnapped and very badly tortured by, by insurgent groups. I had uh, Iraqis who were forced to leave their homes, their country, because they worked for us and they would be seen as collaborators. Those are the most unpleasant um, ones for me. Um, and, and they are, they, they eat away at your soul because the, the you know, we, we all have office lives and, and we have office friendships and if you're lucky those friendships deepen into into strong relationships but uh, but to be serving in a war zone is something quite unique because the relationships you develop there deepen very quickly um, it is very much it's a cliche but it's very much a case of a band of brothers because you're literally in the trenches together and so very quickly you develop a very strong dependency on each other. And so my Iraqi colleagues are no longer my colleagues, but they will never stop being part of my persona. Um, I will be in, invested in their lives for the rest of their lives and to some degree in the lives of their families. Uh, I have worked, as you say, in many countries in many offices, and I have fond memories of friends in many places. But those relationships are, are very deep and they can both be very enriching when something good happens. Recently, a colleague of mine, after a lot of effort, I was able to get him into the US as part of the refugee program. That's a wonderful feeling. And then there are others that are, that are deeply distressing when you hear that they are still being persecuted for the fact that they once upon a time used to work for me. And you're powerless to do something about it. Those are, the, those are the, really the, the bad experiences. Oh, the good ones are, are too many to count. I mean, you know, I, I have been a Barcelona fan since I was a child. To be able to go to Barcelona and meet Leo Messi uh, and, and talk to him, even though he's a very shy person and not particularly talkative, just to be in his presence. You know, even, even a hard-bitten war correspondent can be a starry-eyed fan. Uh, that's certainly what I felt when I was with him. Um, that was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Great. We're, we've just run out of time, but I'm sure the good audience will humor us with five more minutes since we have him here. So one last question before I start my rapid fire round, <laughs> right? Interestingly, you're one of the few people who have credited your success to good fortune. But traditionally, we always, uh, you know, uh, we always say that we are lucky, or we didn't have luck when we fail, right? So what keeps you grounded? No, look, I, I'm, this is not some sad attempt at self-deprecation, I think. It is true, it has always been true for me, that if you look at my, my career through any objective lens, you see repeated incidents where people took chances on me that by any rational calculation they should not have taken. Really, I mean, why did somebody, why did Deccan Chronicle give me a job at 18? I was 18, and they gave me a job. 
and they shouldn't have. They, actually, they didn't know I was 18. I looked older, and that helped me. But it was a stroke of luck. Um, you know, when I left India for the first time, I went to the Far Eastern Economic Review in Hong Kong. It was 1995. It was two years before Hong Kong was going to be handed over to China. And the expat community in Hong Kong began to shrink because a lot of expats, particularly the Brits, began to leave because they knew that once China took over, they would need visas, and they were not sure they would get visas, and there was a lot of concern about what would happen. It turned out to be unnecessary, but people were very, very worried about what China would do to Hong Kong, so a lot of people left. That expat community traditionally had been the pool from which the Far Eastern Economic Review hired people. Hired. That year, 1995, when they, announced, they advertised this job opening, they got very few local applications. And so for the first time in their history, they were forced to look outside. Blind luck. If I had applied one year before, they would not even have opened the envelope because it came from outside of Hong Kong. Just blind luck. You know? um, it, my career is just a, a series of, of, of incidents like that. Now, don't get me wrong. I work hard. I have some, some skills, and I have tried my best to learn from, from experience and apply those learnings in my career. But I, I'm not kidding myself that those things alone are responsible for my career. Uh, every step of the way, people were helpful, and people took chances on me. And the least I can do is try to do the same for other people. And I don't see this as some kind of altruistic do-gooding, and I don't expect a halo over my head. It just seems like a fair bargain. People take chances on me, I take chances on people. You sound very grounded. You haven't changed. <laughs> okay, the rapid fire round now. I'm going to ask you a few questions. You have 30 seconds to think, and you have to answer very quickly. This as long is, as there's no math. This is Bollywood style. Yeah. So what do you see yourself as first, writer or editor? Writer. Right. Next question. News channel or sports channel? Oh. <laughs> uh, sports channel to watch, news channel to work for. Yeah. <laughs> that was a smart answer, but you qualified. This is going to be more difficult. Signed bat from Tendulkar or signed ball from Messi? Messi. Okay. You sure? Absolutely. You're in Bangalore? I know. Okay. <laughs> I have to be true to myself. I, I have signed covers from both of Home cooked meal or eating out? Home cooked meal. Depends on the meal, but home cooked meal. Mutton biryani or seafood paya? Mutton biryani. Sure? Hyderabadi. Hyderabadi. Obama versus Clinton? Clinton. Uh, Bill, not Hillary. <laughs> ITC Gardenia versus Walter Club. <laughs> I have not stayed at the Walter Club. But uh, Walter Club is the club that both of us used to play cricket for. Uh, Walter Club. Walter Club is a part of my childhood. Huh? Last question, and then after this, we'll, we'll continue in the car park. Okay. Bipasha Ghosh versus Bipasha Basu. Oh, Bipasha please. Ghosh is his wife. There's no competition. There's <laughs> no competition. Bipasha Basu doesn't hold a candle to Bipasha Ghosh. Good answer. Very wonderful. Thank Bobby, you. thank you very much. It's an thank absolute pleasure. Thanks.